Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dave Van Zant, the president here at the New School, and uh, just pleased to see everyone, particularly particularly some of our alumni um, who've come back for Alumni Day here and uh, look forward to seeing you all later on. Let me turn over uh, this wonderful event now. Where'd she go? Where's Arian? Oh, there you are. <laughs> to, to Professor Arian Mack, um, who is the editor of Social Research, which is publishing um, some articles on this. You want to show him the, the cartoon on the front? It's there we go. For those of you who um, are familiar with social research, uh, the magazine, you should know this is the first time, I believe, in its entire and long and starred history where it's had a, uh, had a cartoon on the front. So, but again, <laughs> let me turn it over to Erin. Erin? Thanks, David. Hi, thank you for coming, and there were, uh, I welcome to the alumni, and then all the audience, and we are lucky enough to have some of the authors in the audience, and I know we have the person who did our wonderful cover, Bob Grossman, in the audience. <laughs> So th this event this evening is uh, a, a co, a jointly sponsored event by the Center for Public Scholarship and the New School for Drama and Acting. Uh, and uh, it was, we couldn't have done this event. We, we, the issue was uh, in progress when it occurred to us that it might be a good idea to have a uh, event like this. Not that we do these events often. We rarely uh, kick off issues of the journal with an event. But this one seemed a natural. And uh, so uh, we reached out to uh, our colleague who runs the uh, drama school, the acting and drama school, the new school, school, new school for drama and acting, Pippin Parker. And it was really Pippin who made this evening possible. I'm going to in, uh, introduce him in a minute. But I, just before I do, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit, for those of you who don't know, about social research, which has been the journal of the New School for Social Research since 1934. That's a really long time. And it was launched by the first president of the New School, Alvin Johnson. Uh, who actually be, was uh, not only started the new school, but created what uh, f was initially called the University in Exile when he rescued uh, intellectuals and scholars in, the, in 33 and 34 uh, as Hitler was rising to power. And most of the people he rescued, m many of them were Jews, uh, had already lost their academic uh, positions, and they, he brought them to the New School and started a, um, an actual institute for them, which was called the University in Exile. The following year, it was, uh, became the, news, the uh, graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research. And now, because the New School has a way of changing its names, it's now called the New School for Social Research. That is, that was formerly the University in Exile. It was Alvin Johnson, actually, who, uh, whose idea of social research was. He thought that that faculty, uh, very uh, prestigious uh, intellectuals, should have a public voice. And it, they, uh, to the, the, that group with Johnson, began the uh, journal, which has been publishing ever since. Now, tonight's event, uh, uh, which uh, we're happy to be doing, uh, I hope was going to change the nature of social research, because I'm expecting this event to have a bit of levity. And levity is hardly the word you normally would come to mind when you're thinking about social research. So tonight's a change of pace, let's hope. This after, uh, now, let me now introduce uh, Pippin. And uh, before I do, let me just thank, if she can hear me, Roberta Sutton, Sutton who has done all the heavy lifting uh, and does all the heavy lifting for the Center for Public Scholarship. And she is a wonder. Many of you have con had contact with her and know that. So now, Pippin. 
Who is Pippin? <laughs> ah, before I tell you who he is, I need to remind you of something. There is a, an event following this. It's a reception. There are two of them. One is an event f for a reception for alumni, and it's occurring in Walden Hall, which is on the fifth floor of the 11th Street building. You have to walk through the courtyard, which is immediately after this. And the other is an event for everybody else, including the speakers, uh, which is in the lobby. So uh, we hope you all come, and we'll be happy to see you and talk to you then. And now Pippin. Pippin is the director of the New School for Drama and Acting. He is a writer and a director and former chair of the playwriting department. He directed and was the dramaturge of the award-winning production of George Packard's Betrayed at Culture Project, which won an Lortel Award Best Play in 2008. He is founding member and former artistic director of Naked Angels Theater Company in New York City, where he co-conceived their signature issues projects. His plays include Anesthesia, Assisted Living, and numerous one acts, which have been produced in New York and Los Angeles and published by Play Scripts Incorporated. His radio play, A Gift, was produced by NP for NPR, The Next Big Thing. He was a staff writer for the animated series The Tick and has developed several projects for HBO. It's a pleasure to introduce him, Pippin. Thank you. Uh, actually, all we're doing tonight is introductions, so it's just gonna go on and on. Um, um, the last two events uh, that I've been here, which were sponsored by the Center for Public Scholarship, were, I believe, that I attended, were uh, Future of Higher Education with Jamshed Barucha and our own David Van Zant, and Egypt in Transition uh, with Saad Eden Ibrahim. And um, they solved those problems. Uh, <laughs> And I think why Arian reached out to me was uh, because, frankly, they've, uh, they're have they done with the fluff, and we want to move on to some more serious, weighty material. Uh, I thank you all so much for being here, and thank our guests who uh, Marvin will introduce. But I want to introduce Marvin. Uh, um, and later, we'll introduce all of you to each other. <laughs> Our mod monitor, a moderator, our moderator for this evening is Marvin Kitman. Marvin was the media television critic at Newsday from 1969 to 2005. As he told readers of his daily column, Newsday gave him an audition, and after 35 years, he and the editors agreed it wasn't working out. <laughs> he is now writing columns at InvestorUprising.com, his latest satirical caper, doing punditry in the manner of his comic heroes, James Reston, Arthur Kroc, and Walter Lippmann. As a historian, he is the only living co-author of George Washington, George Washington's Expense Account by General George Washington and Marvin Kipman, PFC retired, is the best-selling expense account in publishing history. He is the author of eight other books, starting with the number one bestseller, uh, that's the title, not the sales report. His latest book is The Man Who Would Not Shut Up, The Rise of Bill O'Reilly, a quote, Fair, balanced biography, a remarkable achievement, according to the New York Times Sunday Book Review. Or that's according to what Marvin said, the book review said. I'm not positive about that. It's the only book to have anything positive to say about Bill O'Reilly, except for the seven books Bill O'Reilly wrote about himself. <laughs> a founding father of Monocle magazine until its untimely demise, he was also a staff writer at the Saturday Evening Post. His motto as a freelance writer is, uh, was publish and perish. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to uh, introduce to you Marvin Kitman. I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> well, 
Welcome to all of you friends of social research. Now, I hope you've all found seats here or standing room. I told them the subject warranted holding this event at Madison Square Garden, or even better at Mets Stadium, City Field, the Mets being a continual source of humor. <laughs> but I, I wanted to thank this wonderful magazine, Social Research, which I never miss reading, <laughs> without which this important event in the history of politics and comedy wouldn't have been possible. Now, one ground rule, you are not allowed to laugh. This is an analytic magazine, and we have a very analytic panel here. The highlight, the height of comedy and politics, the absolute zenith, the apogee, took place in the 1964 election. The Republican Party was involved in a fight about who was in the mainstream of the party, Goldwater or Rockefeller. One man courageously said, none of the above. He called Rockefeller an FDR-type Republican, Goldwater a moderate, whose ideas only went back to McKinley's day, 1900. He alone was the only truly serious reactionary in the race. He was a Lincoln Republican. His ideas went back to 1864. To demonstrate his seriousness, he was running on the Republican Party platform of 1864 so many of whose promises had yet to be fulfilled. <laughs> he promised to end the war with the South. Civil rights was a major issue in 1964. He promised to reinforce Fort Sumter. <laughs> he campaigned in New Hampshire, claiming he was twice as Jewish as Goldwater. That's called playing the religion card. I had a holy ghostwriter who told me to say that. He lost anyway, but he did manage to tie Harold Stassen at the convention in the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Both got zero. <laughs> you may have forgotten the details about the 1964 race, but you may remember his slogan, I would rather be president than right. <laughs> at the time, he had the biggest writer's block on his block in New Jersey. His goal had been to become a footnote to history. He more than succeeded that. And you, Rick Perlstein had written this wonderful, otherwise fine book on the 1964 election. It's on page 234 of footnote. You can look it up. I know that, can that campaign so well, having been the candidate, it was an experience that prepared me for the closest thing we have had to that quintessential 1964 campaign. This year, as we have all lived through the Republican Party battle to find who was in the mainstream again. Was it the seriously moderate from Massachusetts? What's his name? <laughs> or the fruitcake, Michelle Bachman? <laughs> the man from another planet, Ron Paul? The ever amusing Newt Gingrich running for president of the moon colony. <laughs> Rick Santorum, the only candidate to have a Latin name. <laughs> and the weak stomach who wanted to throw up whenever he heard anyone discussing separation of church and state, which led to the establishment of the vomit index ratings. <laughs> And who can ever forget Mr. 999, <laughs> Herman Cain, who gave us 999 reasons for not electing him? <laughs> or was that the number of girlfriends who kept popping up? <laughs> Terry Southern, Kurt Vonnegut, nobody could have written a funnier script than those 19 debates. They made you forget Douglas versus Lincoln of 1854. Media pathologists, historians, social scientists, humorologists will be studying 2012 primaries. 
The panel today will undoubtedly be mentioning them. The reason we are all here today, the purpose, the editors of social research, and entertaining quarterly, I should point out, is that we plan to explore in the next 90 minutes or so the history of political satire or comedy. Satire has become a dirty word today. Everybody knows satire died on Saturday afternoon. But at any rate, the history of political satire for the last 2,500 years, which probably began with the Bible, as some atheists believed. <laughs> the panel's goal is to have a scholarly discussion about the making of presidents, the making of news media, the making what what, what makes people laugh or cry, the making of, uh, of what's happening in the world of comedy or the world, whichever is more important. We will be talking about why everybody is picking on Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> Just because he is blaming all those trustworthy persons who personally betrayed him and by another trustworthy person who betrayed the other trustworthy per person, eventually he will blame the mailroom boy. <laughs> the Supreme Court is the invention of super PACs, the best tool for educating the public since the invention of Sunday morning intellectual ghetto shows? Or does it make a mockery of democratic process or anything else that crosses the panelists' minds as they as they ponder the state of the nation of comedy and politics. We have a superstar panel today, folks, the most prestigious group discussing this subject on the west side of Manhattan today. <laughs> they are all people who usually need no introduction. Uh, nevertheless, I have a few words to say about them anyway. The empty chair, by the way, uh, is in case Rick Santorum or Newt Gingrich decides to join the debate as they fight for delegates. <laughs> now, we will start off with Tim Carvel, who is uh, in the middle seat here. <laughs> will Rogers said he did not need to write jokes all he had to do was read the papers about what they did in Washington that day. The Daily Show performs that function. Tim it was 12 years as the head writer for the Alita. No, no. <laughs> Am I wrong already? Two, two, two. Two, two years ahead. Two years ahead. Two years? Two. I, I can go. It just, <laughs> it just seemed like 12 years, excuse me. We, as a journalist, I'm known for my facts. <laughs> Nevertheless, I was going to say that with that stint that uh, we would wind up uh, having his head examined at the National Institute of Mental Health for having done all that. Tim is also a contributor to Slate Magazine and McSweeney's. He also writes for the New York Times, Entertainment Weekly, Fortune Magazine, Sports Illustrated, and Modern Humorist. His column in Mad Magazine, Planet Tad, is coming out in hardcover in May. Best of luck with it. Nancy Giles is a writer, performer, and contributor to CBS News this morning. Nancy has appeared in dozens of films and TV shows, a collaborator. That's not bad. Long time ago. Uh, no, that's fine. A lo <laughs> Some. You wish. <laughs> Some. Collaborator on two public <laughs> affairs radio series for CBS Radio Network. And radio, by the way, is the medium of the future. And she's the co-host of Giles and Moriarty, which already won back-to-back -back Gracie's for Best Radio Talk Show. You may also have seen her in Second City or in her two shows that she wrote, 
black comedy, the wacky side of racism, and notes of a neurotic, of a Negro neurotic. Yeah. Victor Navasky is another case. He's the one with the beard. <laughs> Publisher emeritus and editorial director of The Nation, which is my favorite satirical journal, <laughs> next to the Congressional Record. <laughs> he is the founding father of Monocle Magazine, an ironical chronicle, uh, a periodical which claimed to be a leisurely quarterly of political satire. It came out so irregularly at times it was actually ruled to be a sporadical <laughs> rather than a periodical. His other claims to fame, he is now George T. Delacourt, professor of magazine journalism at Columbia Journalism School, director of the Delacourt Center for Magazine Journalism and chair of Columbia Journalism Review. His books include Mission Accomplished or How We Won the War in Iraq. <laughs> a Matter of Opinion, Naming Names. He is currently at work on a book about political cartoons if it ever gets finished. Uh, now in interests of full disclosure and transparency, I should point out that Victor was my campaign manager in 1964. <laughs> I fired him. I blamed him for my defeat. In the few moments we have left, <laughs> each candidate will be able to make a brief opening statement <laughs> of 15 seconds or less, or longer if the spirit so moves him. They will tell us why they are here and not elsewhere. <laughs> you waive your right to remain silent. Without further ado, as Shakespeare said, we're gonna wade right into the discussion of the first 2,500 years of politics and comedy. Tim, my first question is to you, um, as the head writer of The Daily Show. Uh, your leader at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, uh, giving at the end of his lecture, asked for a show of hands about how many thought his show was the best source of news today. He looked around at the sea of hands and all these hands were up, and he said, this is pathetic. <laughs> Tim, how do you feel about the way people think if they stay up to watch The Daily Show? Are they well informed? And how did this happen, and why? Um, Uh, I, I, th I think we all feel a certain ambivalence or apprehension about the notion that people would rely on us for anything. Uh, <laughs> we are comedy writers. We, you know, uh, specialize in st stupid jokes, and so there's there's a, there, there's a sense of. Uh, I, I think John has said in the past that, like, to the extent that. Uh, anyone says that they get their news from us, it's, it's almost more of a protest vote than an actual fact. I think that you kind of can't quite, uh, you can't get your news from our show, uh, alone at least. Uh, we, we, we're an augment, we're a garnish, we're parsley, if you will, but uh, we're, we're not a meal. Uh, and so I think that, uh, yeah, I, I almost feel like people say that, but they don't mean it. At least we hope they don't mean it. <laughs> The okay. end. <laughs> That's your story, and you're sticking to it, I assume. Uh, I have a question for uh, Nancy now. Uh, Romney's dog. <laughs> <laughs> 
my best laugh, <laughs> was a staple of Gail Collins's very funny co coverage in the Times. I think she did about 82 columns on the dog. <laughs> well, what I'm asking, was this fair to dogs? <laughs> Should the New York Times apologize to the dog world? <laughs> what do you make of that? No, uh, no, I think it was a service to the, um, to the canine community. Uh, <laughs> because I think that uh, Mitt Romney is a dangerous uh, individual to animals. Um, I don't think he should own animals, and uh, I think he should be outed as a, as a dog hater. So uh, I think that Gail Collins and the Times did a uh, service to uh, us all. The, he's been losing the do dog demographic anyway. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, Hey, you guys are allowed to uh, uh, chime in on these oh. pressing issues that anything that I've raised, and certainly the dog issue <laughs> so far. Okay, Victor, you are the world's leading authority on political cartooning, or will be if you ever finish writing that book. <laughs> My question is why has there been a decline in the art form, or has there been? I can see Bob Grossman. I know Mort Gerberg is in the audience, so <laughs> I, there, I know there is no decline in political cartoons, but I want to come back to your campaign. First of all, I want, <laughs> first of all, I want to tell you all, he's a very sore loser. <laughs> he blames me for his not being president of the United States. And I have to tell you, we trudged up to New Hampshire, and Governor Scranton of Pennsylvania was the dark horse candidate in that race. And we, in New Hampshire, you can get a delegate on the ballot if he fought, pays $75, it used to be, to get on the ballot. We got a photographer up there from the local paper to be a Kitman delegate, and Marvin got 23 votes more than uh, Scranton got in New Hampshire. So this is a very successful campaign. We went all the way to California uh, where the convention was and they had a big blackboard for press conferences every day and uh, with and we had a group of uh, volunteers. We gave them buttons that said spontaneous demonstrator and paid volunteer. <laughs> and these, these volunteers, uh, we armed them all with chalk. So whenever there was an empty spot on the blackboard for press conferences for other candidates, they wrote in Marvin's name so he would have a round of press conferences out there. So it was a very uh, innovative, creative <laughs> campaign. Uh, so I don't like that you would suggest that I didn't do a good job. So even though I describe myself as the campaign mismanager of that campaign. And, and now let me say a word of how I became an expert in campaigns, um, and you described us as candidates. As the founding editor and publisher of Monocle, Marvin was right, we called ourselves the Leisurely Quarterly. That meant we came out twice a year. And then eventually we tried to be a monthly, and we had one issue of the monthly, and then we became the radical sporadical that Marvin is describing. <laughs> but putting out Monocle, you know, every magazine, this was 19, we tried to become a, a monthly in 1960. And this was uh, a, every magazine in those days had a typical reader. It's still sort of true today. Playboys was the young man about town. The New Yorkers was not the old lady from Dubuque. Uh, Mademoiselle, you know, was a young woman who liked to get married. And we took a survey to find out who our typical reader was, and we found out our typical reader was Jack Kennedy. <laughs> So, so, and we, we did uh, run articles about the president and presidencies all the time. We had an article by Oliver Jensen on Eisenhower's version of the Gettysburg Address. It began, I haven't checked these figures yet, but 87 years ago, I think it was. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, we, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I'll come back to cartoons later, so.
Well, I, I don't like airing our uh, uh, dirty political laundering in front of all these people, but I should point out that <laughs> as my head strategist, Victor, aimed our campaign at um, the 25th ballot, and his strategy was they will be so tied up between uh, who is the, uh, in the main street in the Republican Party that by the 25th ballot that uh, they will be desperate and they will turn to either me or Harold Stassen. <laughs> and since I was so much more uh, you know, personable, that that's how I get the nomination, but it, it failed, the strategy. Okay. Um, now, I would like to, yes. I'm raising, yeah, I'm in school, so I feel like I need to raise my hand, but. Um, oh, no, 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 you're allowed. Um, you, <laughs> thank you. Um, you'd said it was okay to kind of like jump yes, in. So interrupt. You were talking earlier about people. Especially the other people. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> you had said earlier that people who consider The Daily Show as a source for their news, that you, were, you guys were pretty ambivalent toward that, which I can understand. But there was a funny moment a couple of years ago when you had that, um, when The Daily Show and uh, the Colbert Report had the uh, rally to, what was it called, the rally to? Uh, uh, and the rally to uh, restore, restore sanity, sanity. And, and or fear. And yeah. or fear, which was, <laughs> that was 2010. It was 2010, yeah. It was very well attended. Yeah. And uh, I watched, I, didn't, I wasn't able to go, I had a work conflict, so. But um, what struck me about that rally was that there, were, uh, there was a big group of people that were probably potential voters, people who are thinkers, people with a good sense of humor, and the only time I ever heard anyone during the rally mention, make sure you vote, was Tony Bennett. And honest to God, I mean, I, and I watched it, I thought, whether, you know, whether Jon Stewart or Stephen Colbert wanted to try to swing votes one way or the other, the basic, hey, you're here, go out and vote theme didn't seem to be Hit, and I was a little frustrated. I'm not, you know, not blaming you for what happened in 2010 <laughs> by any means, but I was just uh, wondering. I, what but you... I, I will take full responsibility. Okay, well, good, because uh. someone should. But I was just wondering what you thought of what you know what you, your thinking was on that. Um, I almost feel like um, if if someone wasn't going to vote until we told them to that day, <laughs> then I don't want them voting. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I feel like the, 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 the event wasn't intended to sort of uh, be a, a political event. It was almost intended to be uh, a commentary on the way we talk about and the way we, uh, the lens through which we view problems, which is the media, and the way it w in which it distorts and uh, amplifies and, and, and fails to do justice to the world we live in. Uh, that prevents us from from actually getting things done and, and, and getting problems solved, um, and so I, I think that that was more of the objective of that event um, rather than to uh, to to encourage voting. I mean, well, I know it wasn't like a voter registration event right. or anything like that, but um, it just occurred to me because we've reached this point where entertainment and politics and the media is all kind of one big glop, you know. And, and the lines keep crossing, so. Uh, Glop being a scientific term, <laughs> of course. Uh, no, I think that's, uh, certainly uh, the lines get blurred. Uh, as, as, as John has said, it, it feels more like they are coming towards us than we are coming towards them. Uh, that politics is sort of, and, and the media are coming towards the realm of entertainment more than that uh, we are trying to enter into right. their world. And I almost feel like we, uh, can't, can't and don't want to sort of uh, engage in the world in a way of just like, well, if we do this, this will happen. Uh, you know, it's not, it not only is not how the world works, uh, it, it, uh, it would ruin what we do. Um, so I, I feel like, I don't know if that's an answer, but no, that's, that's, cool. um, that, 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 that's, that's kind of how, how we feel about it, that, that we, that we want to you know, look at what comes in, put it through our process, sort of say how we feel about it. But uh, if we if we feel ourselves driving that process, uh, something's gone horribly wrong. Thank you. Uh, Tim, Tim, I, I don't want to make this seem like a um, 
a, uh, a, a, um, that we're grilling you uh, unfairly. But, but since uh, although, you... Although the interior of the Death Star is a wonderful place for that. <laughs> And you can plead the Fifth Amendment on this question anyway. And, you know, as um, uh, you're, you're the head writer for um, uh, the most trusted fake news, I think they call it, and uh, so that, uh, that John is actually, for a whole generation, he has the impact of, of Walter Cronkite on, on this generation. Okay, now, and, and I, uh, this is an analytic um, uh, evening, so I'm gonna ask you an analytic question about journalism here. One of the basic tools that your program seems to use is taking things out of context. You take news clips out of context and you run them together, you know, what the senators have said or what candidates have said, and this is a process that is known, the technical phrase for it is a contextectomy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when Fox News does this, I'm not an apologist for them, but when they do it, it's pretty evil. But here you're doing that almost every night and you get a lot of laughs on that. Do you feel any sense of guilt about what you're doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> Uh, I was raised Catholic, so that's just my default setting. Uh, but I, I will say, I, I, will, I will take exception to the notion that we take things out of context. I, I actually don't believe that that's what we do, and I think we, we work hard not to do that. Uh, we, when, when we are looking at a clip, uh, the question is often asked, what was said before and after that? We, we try and make sure that when we put something on the show, uh, it, is, it is framed and phrased in the way that is fairest, uh, the fairest possible way to the people uh, involved. Not, not because, well not just because it's good to be fair, but because we feel like uh, it's not funny if it's not true. Um, I, if, there, if there are specific examples th that can be brought up, uh, we, we, could, we could talk about them, but I, I actually, we have a researcher whose job it is to come and yell at us if we have taken something out of context. Here's and what is the punishment, by the way? Uh, I, I, Won't do it again? Uh, he, he yells at us b before we tape the show. Uh, oh. it, it would be a very inefficient process if he came down the morning after. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Victor, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, I was interested in what you said about fairness, and, um, and I'm interested that there is an article in this magazine. Uh, Victor, do you want to come up and use a mic here? Because oh, uh, your mic fell off. Uh, your mic fell off. And I don't, here we go. Wait a minute. Sorry. Uh, takes a pro. She knows the, she knows the broadcasting business. So yes, I do. Okay. Takes a pro. I'll let you do it. Wait, Thank well, you. I don't know it that well, but wait. Okay. <laughs> Start again from That's the beginning, good. Victor. Okay. okay. So you, you were talking about trying to be fair, and I noticed that there's an article in here uh, on saying that being funny is not that funny on, on cartoons. And um, Marvin had asked me a question about cartoons at the beginning, and in my own looking at cartoons about which I pretend to know expertise, the ones that interest, the, interest me the most are caricatures. And caricatures are by definition unfair. And they are exaggerations, they're not true. And, and you said, but we always want to be, tell the truth. My theory is the reason people get so upset about caricatures, and they really do, the leading uh, Palestinian cartoonist was shot down on the streets of London. The people get agitated in ways, as you know, from the Danish caricatures of Muhammad. One of the reasons I think that people get so upset about caricatures, which are gross exaggerations and by definition unfair, is because they suspect that they may have gotten to the real you, and that the, the so-called exaggeration is a penetration into the ultimate truth. So I wish that you would be unfair in the interest of truth. <laughs> oh, oh, I, 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 I think, I think, yeah, 
I, to be clear, yeah, I, I think that we, that, that probably is an, is, an, is an accurate description of what we do, that, that it is, we present, you know, the most extreme moments of anybody that, that we're talking about, and, and, and that, that, that's that is the real how we person. Treat them. That's the unguarded yeah. real person by mistake. Yeah. So. Well, the thing uh, but, I really, I'm sorry, sorry, but the thing yeah. I really dig about The Daily Show, again, is that you do set things up in very specific ways, and it, it's always truthful, and it's funny. Now, Fox News, which has the word news after it, and they're supposed to be journalists, they're always like making, adding crowds to scenes to make it look like a Tea Party rally had more people, even though half of the screen shows it's summer and the other half there's snow. <laughs> you know, they're... I mean, they're always, they're doing all these things. They, they purposely will drop the last half of anything that President Obama says to spin it a certain way. And they're news. That's, and that's funny, but it shouldn't be funny. You know? That's true. That's true. Uh, Victor, uh, cartoony, you know, I'm, I'm still fascinated how, you know, a Danish publication can, can set the world on fire, literally, you know, from the, these, uh, the cartoons. Now, does it follow that if social research, instead of this jolly Uncle Sam, if it had uh, a, a, a cartoon, a Muhammad-type cartoon, would, would this also start the world on fire, which would help circulation very much <laughs> for the magazine? Well, how does it happen? What would happen if they did it here? In the next issue. Yeah, I don't want to tell social research it's business. But the fact is that, uh, you know, the Bible, the second commandment of the Bible, no graven images. The, the Old Testament is not the only place that understands the uh, power of graven images and cartoons and caricatures. And uh, Grossman and Gerberg do as well. My experience was in 30 years at The Nation magazine, only once did the staff march on my office in advance with a petition demanding that we not publish something, and it was a cartoon. It was a caricature by David Levine, who arguably was the greatest caricaturist in the world, uh, who did a caricature of Henry Kissinger. And it was at the time his report on the Caribbean Basin came out, and it showed Kissinger on top and the world in the form of a woman on bottom with a globe where her head would have been under an American flag blanket. And Levine had called me in advance and told me that the cartoon was too strong for New York Review. They wouldn't publish it. Would the nation be interested? I said, and he, he said, it shows Kissinger screwing the world. And I said, well, <laughs> and I said, well David, uh, yes, we would be very interested, but it'll get me in a lot of trouble with the staff. And he said, why? And I said, I don't know, but I know it will. <laughs> and sure enough, about 45 minutes after it landed in the office, this p petition landed on my desk with little things on the side saying, sexist, why isn't he doing it to a third world male? And we, we had a big meeting and we called David into the office and David said all the wrong things. He said, you know, in an office with five, five self-declared gay people, he said, I'm just showing what normal people do. And, uh, and they were attacking him for, for showing sex. And they were saying the nation is supposed to be against stereotypes and you're showing sex is something that an active male on top does to a passive woman on bottom. And uh, so it's, it raises uh, fascinating questions because uh, cartoonists, by definition, deal with stereotypes which are exaggerations that are unfair, and they are racist, and they are anti-Semitic sometimes, and they are uh, not uh, accurate portraits, and yet uh, frequently they get it underlying Real truths. That's well put. Uh, I have a question, Nancy. Uh, I I uh, see a lot of uh, apologies being made. Um, people make a statement uh, of their beliefs, and then they, you know, all right, uh, who wants? Who cares about uh, what this celebrity had to say or what this baseball manager had to say? But but I. Personally, I'm appalled by this trend of the need to apologize, whether it's a writer, a comedian, or a, a baseball manager. Uh, have, is, why, what is it about this 
climate that we have uh, in a democracy where theoretically we have free speech, where everybody has to apologize. Well, it's funny. I think there's actually a couple of different things going at the same time. One is you have um, the non-apology apology, where the person will say something like, if the words that I said were <laughs> offensive to anyone, <laughs> That was not my intent. And right. you know, the words, I'm sorry, are never a part of that sentence. So that's the first thing. So your bases are kind of covered without actually taking any responsibility. And I, I do know what you mean. I think Bill Maher was also talking about it. I mean, there, there does need to be sort of a freedom of discourse and freedom of speech and that kind of jazz. But you know, I don't know, just as a woman sometimes, I find that women get a certain extra helping of the slam. And, and it, it might seem funny to some people, but like, let's just take, for example, Rush Limbaugh. You know, the stuff that he says, it, I, are we allowed to curse? Okay, I'm gonna do it, I don't care. The shit isn't funny, it's just, it's mean. And, it's, and, and of course, he doesn't, he does the non-apology apology, but you never wanna, I don't think you ever wanna stifle anybody's, uh, ability to express themselves. And at the same time, when I want to be funny, like I want to be funny. Um, and I want to be able to be funny and not have to apologize. And my mind is sort of trailing because I can sort of see him sort of in a circuit about the whole thing. So I, it's, I don't know. I think you should probably be using the word shit in the new school. Oh, I apologize <laughs> for using the word shit at the new school. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. Good. I didn't even hear it until you just said it. <laughs> to any, well, people are leaving, look at this, oh my God. <laughs> Come back, Excrement, Come back. Oh, okay. Oh, jeez. But, it's. I'm, I'm boring, is that what you said? Somebody said you're boring? Oh my God, did they mean me personally or this whole do thing? We, do we all have to apologize, no. <laughs> no, but it seems to me that, that almost anything that you would say in a democracy will offend somebody. So you just got to have this a mass apology that, that, that you, you know, they're, they're so frequently now, I mean, I think that we could have an apology network on TV. <laughs> 24-7, people standing, oh, I said this, and let me tell you how I'm retracting it. Well, the first one, I wasn't that serious, but the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, oh, you got it. And you would have a, a board of people of uh, analyzing the, how sincere is this? Well, you know, here's a perfect example. Um, the the so-called insult against Ann Romney, where um, Hillary Cohen said she hasn't worked a day in her life. Yes. Uh, all right. So she's very wealthy and she has a family and she probably has worked, but I think that, I mean, again, I'm not gonna try to dissect what Hillary Cohen said and, huh? I mean, oh, Hillary, oh, Hillary Rosen. Oh, sorry, who is Hillary Cohen? Oh, she's an ex-agent <laughs> of mine, I'm sorry. <laughs> we apologize to Hillary if I Cohen. <laughs> oh, man. Wherever oh, you are. <laughs> You know, I'm beginning to bore myself. But anyway, uh, I don't think she needed to apologize. Let's just let it stay there. Her feeling was she never worked. And I wasn't there. But a wealthy woman with a lot of sons, it's going to be a different kind of work than a single mom who's got to work full time and then raise children. It just, it just is. That's, that's, so I wouldn't have apologized. I, I think the worst was this poor baseball manager of the Miami Marlins who gave his opinion about Fidel Castro, and, and they, they, they suspended him. The team suspended him, and how did they decide that five days was the right punishment <laughs> for speaking about Fidel? All right, now, do we have the big question, and all, all of you would like you to answer this, do we have any sacred cows left in this country in terms of satire, um, or have they all left the barn already? Uh, do they have, okay. What, what's sacred anymore? Yeah, my, my experience, Speak up. Victor. My experience, Marvin. Well, I think my, that, my- I don't know why I keep, do, it's the, I guess it's huh? the woman in me, I don't know. Okay, well, good. How's that? Good, good. Okay. thank you. 
My experience is that it's not a question of sacred cows. It is a question of something you were talking about before, which is the uh, inability to distinguish between reality and something that isn't real. And I, when, you, when we were at, at Monocle many years ago, I remember coming into the office one day, and there was a headline in the business pages of the New York Times which said, peace scare causes market to drop 30 points, and something like that. <laughs> and uh, out of that headline, we, we concocted an idea. And the idea was, suppose the president had appointed a commission to plan the transition from a war time economy or an economy that lived under the threat of war to, the, to an economy that was a peacetime economy. And the commission met and uh, decided that the economy would collapse without the threat of war. Uh, what, what would happen? And we decided to do a book on it. And we did a book called Report from Iron Mountain. The that was my got next to do this question. Before, this is, I'm, I'm going. To, in All my right. roundabout way, I apologize, Marvin. I'm going my roundabout way to answer the question, or to avoid answering the question, but anyway. And uh, what is Report from Iron Mountain, Victor? <laughs> anyway, we did this book, Report from Iron Mountain. So what it was, was we recruited to write this a, a great writer named Leonard Lewin. And Leonard Lewin said, I can't do the story of the suppression of a report that didn't exist called Report from Iron Mountain until there is a report to suppress. So he went and wrote a brilliant parody of a think tank, re, think tank ease in the form of a, a report, and then wrote a book that talked about its suppression. And all of the footnotes in this report were to real articles. And he had gotten people like John Kenneth Galbraith and uh, people at the Institute for Policy Studies and other places to help him cite real articles in this report. And uh, when, when it came out, and, he, and the New York Times reporter called the White House to ask whether it was real or a, a, or a hoax, it had been published by Dial Press on the nonfiction list. And the editor-in-chief of Dial Press at the time was a fellow named E.L. Doctorow, who had later came to fame for his ability to not recognize the, the distinction between fiction and fact in his novels. <laughs> um, and uh, when the reporter called the White House, it was the Johnson White House, and the report was about a rep from Iron Mountain was about an alleged report that the Kennedy administration had commissioned and then was suppressed. The Johnson White House, instead of saying it, it doesn't exist, said no comment. <laughs> and, the and one of the weekly news magazines said LBJ hit the roof when someone said no comment, not because because they didn't know if the report existed or not. They had no idea what the Kennedys had done. The result of all of that <laughs> was that the report got on the front page of the New York Times. It became a bestseller. And the report said that it was a government policy to have a wartime economy. 20 years later, it turned out that militia groups in the deep south and the middle west had thought this report was real. And it was one of the required readings on their list. <laughs> <laughs> and they took the report and thinking that it was a real government report and therefore not copyrighted, they reprinted it, thousands of copies on their own, and sent it to their members. Without royalties. Without royalties. Leonard Lewin sued them, got the reports back, and, every, and 10 years later, the Wall Street Journal had a front page report saying that this thing was still being read by them and that the people who read it and, and read Leonard's statement saying that he made it all up they said, this was the proof that he's part of the cover-up. <laughs> and I told this story in, the, uh, in an introduction to the report when we republished it after that. And they went on the radio and claimed that I was part of the cover-up, and that's the truth about it. So my point is only, it's not that it's a sacred cow. It's that the line is gone. But uh, thank you. You did not answer my question. <laughs> but it was very interesting anyway. Uh, Tim, are there any sacred cows uh, on The Daily Show? Um, from things not, that you would stay away from. No, nothing and we, we won't would, quote you. Uh, uh, nothing that we, that we make a conscious effort to stay away from. Uh, it's almost as if uh, 
If it's, if it's being discussed uh, in the public discourse, it's something that we would want to talk about on our show. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there probably are topics that are off limits in, in, in the public discourse, so they don't just sort of, they, they don't come into our show that way. Uh, none that I can name off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll say though, like, if it's being discussed in public, it's something that we would want to handle on our show. Uh, one of the weirdest days at the show was the day that the uh, Abu Ghraib photographs made the news. And the first question was just like, how do we handle this? Right. And, Can you uh, show it? And at a certain point, we realized like the, the reaction of just shock and horror at the photographs had to be what got expressed out there. And that's, that's one of the liberating things about the show is sort of realizing that uh, at a certain point, uh, if it's emotionally true, if it's what you actually, the, the question that's often asked in the, in the writer's room is, how do we actually feel about this? Let's start from that and work, work forward, rather than trying to write the jokes uh, and then figure out how they go together. It makes, it makes the work actually a lot easier if it comes from a place of, this is how we feel about it, now let's find a way to express that comedically. One of the interesting things to me is that, oh, Marvin, we're not allowed to talk about the things we're not allowed to talk about. That's the problem with your question. But anyway, one of the interesting things to me is that uh, the Abu Ghraib photographs were so disgusting, and yet the Muslim, the Danish cartoon caricatures of Muhammad resulted in hundreds of thousands of radical Muslims taking to the streets people getting killed, uh, boycotting goods with tens of millions of dollars lost. The world went crazy over, over a cartoon, a caricature, which people knew was not real. They looked at these pictures, and, and they were offended, deeply offended and disgusted by them, but they didn't go off the deep end. And the real interesting question to me is why not, and I'm curious whether you... I, 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 that I had never actually made that connection before. It's a really good question. I actually don't know. I mean, I wonder if like a cartoon both is a way to sneak something in and but, you know, but it also hits a, a hot button, you know, in a way that, that other things don't. I mean, I know that South Park has, has had that experience as far as an animated show. Like it, it certainly does stuff that no live action show could ever in a million years get away with and addresses topics in this kind of bracing and amazing way. But I, they've also, you know, certainly triggered their share of uh, protests and controversy as a result of that. Um, I, I fell asleep uh, early that night that you dealt with the uh, Danish cartoon issue. How did you handle that? I am honestly I know trying, it's, a, it's a visual medium, but... Uh, I'm honestly trying to remember one of the consequences of having worked at the show as long as we, uh, I have. I, I've been head writer two, for... Two years. I, I've been, uh, actually, head writer for, <laughs> head writer for, for a year and a half, uh, uh, a staff writer at the show since 04. But, uh, so, I know I was there during it. I honestly can't recall what we did on it. Uh, the, I honestly can't recall what we did on the show this week. It is a, a serious <laughs> and persistent problem. We'll, we'll sit down on Fridays to sort of talk about how the week went and figure out like which, show, which elements worked. And, and uh, if the board has been taken down, uh, none of us can remember what happened. <laughs> I, I, I'm not being coy. I, I, I honestly, I, I just don't remember. We accept that apology. <laughs> Victor, do you have a... I can tell you how, how I'm handling it, because when I s proposed this cartoon book, my editor said, does this mean you want to run this, <laughs> this picture and get my office blown up? And, and I said, look, I, you can find these pictures. First of all, they're lousy cartoons. There are a couple yeah. of interesting ones, one with the turban with a bomb going off, and another one where they say, we've run out of virgins, and, and it's a funny cartoon, uh, so there's no reason to have suicide bombers anymore. But uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the fact was that uh, I believe that you, since you can see them anyway, and since these are lousy cartoons, there's no great issue of principle in not running them. And it's easy for us to say you ought to, you ought to do this. But uh, people whose lives may be at stake or, build, or real estate, uh, you don't want to tell them what they have to do. So what I proposed to my editor, and they agreed to it, was that I would put the cartoon in there of the uh, Muhammad with the t his turban as a bomb, but if they were worried about it, I would put a big sign right where his face was saying censored over it, <laughs> and that's the way it's going to appear. So. Uh, 
Uh, I wanted to weigh in about the um, weigh in. Uh, I'm weighing about the sacred cows because I'm I'm in a kind of I like the position that I'm in in the sense that um, I'm an opinion writer and before any of the commentaries I do appear on Sunday morning, the word opinion is is on the screen, so everyone knows I'm just talking about how I feel. That doesn't mean that they that people who don't like my opinions don't then. Uh, lambast CBS and say that they're uh, lefties and whatever. But um, in the time that I have done pieces there, I, I talk about all kinds of things. And partly how I got into politics was, I think the, the second essay I did for Sunday Morning had to do with this thought I had about wealthy politicians helping, you know, helping out where they, where they were uh, being a politician, like Mike Bloomberg being so, so, so wealthy at a time when there were so many areas of need in New York. It was just my own thought about, hey, write some checks, you know, trying to help out. I, that's, you know, again, it's my opinion, you know. So, um, but um, there were certain political things in the time that I was on the show that I couldn't really find anything humorous about, yet I wrote about them anyway. Hurricane Katrina, the aftermath of that was just incredibly painful. And I, I love what you said about you start with how you feel, because that's, that's what I did, and I remember at the time hearing a, uh, a young black girl say about the whole situation that she didn't think that being poor was being a criminal. It, w it wasn't a crime to be poor, yet she felt like she was being treated like a criminal because of her economic situation and because of what was going on. And I ended up writing something very serious about that. Um, more recently, although the piece didn't make it on the air, the Trayvon Martin um, shooting and situation. I couldn't really find anything funny about that, nor was I trying to. So, um, did, you I, tr did you try to do a piece on that? I did. It didn't make it on air, but because the t sometimes with uh, when news breaks, the timing of it can can throw things off on Sunday morning. If something has really saturated the news before anything I might say would come on on Sunday. That is one reason why some of the things don't make it on the air. There may be other reasons, yes. but you know, I'm happy to be there. But um, yeah, th so there are some things that if, uh, that if, they, you know, if I'm not laughing, if I can't find anything, I'm not going to try to force that. I, I've always objected to the word opinion uh, on the screen to start with. You know, it implies I, as a, a, a media pathologist, uh, I remember when that all started uh, was actually the word commentary on the evening news when Howard K. Smith or... Uh, the, Harry Reasoner too, yeah. Or Harry Reasoner, uh, you know, their essays at the end that had to be labeled and that was during the Nixon administration and when Agnew was going after everybody. But the, the word, it, it's as if... Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, in the mere selection of the so-called straight news story is a matter of opinion That's to start true. with, because they have 23 minutes uh, to tell us the whole world, and, uh, and they pick out what's the... Uh, uh, what is deemed most what important. What is the term. most important story, and then the commentator like, or the... the uh, uh, opinion meister like uh, Walter Cronkite would say, and that's the way it is. And convincing people that that is the way it is. But on the other hand, if you had uh, Ayn Rand or Paul Krasner or uh, Bob Grossman on with their selection of news, it would be a totally different view. So I always thought that was a cowardly thing that television started as a response to Nixon and Agnew, but at any rate. You're not calling me a coward though, right? I mean, excuse you know, me? You're not calling me. No, 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 the television well, okay. no, is I'm an institution. You. That was but, humor, I was trying. No, no, not, not, I, <laughs> I'm not gonna apologize for that. No, I'm not. No. <laughs> the other no. word, the other word that, that you have to worry about in, in the print medium is correction because the, the implication is everything else in the paper is true. It's true, it's right. Correct, <laughs> right. Which is false. And, and, and it's so shameful the way they corrected. The New York Times has almost a whole page of corrections now. And then you, who knows what they're correcting. So it never catches up. 
So I hope if there are any New York Times reporters here, they are not going to write down what we're saying, and then we have to read the correction page. <laughs> There, there, is, there is something I love in, in that uh, a, a little while ago, uh, there was a, uh, it might have been Roger Ailes, it might have been somebody else at Fox who explained very carefully, no, 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 uh, that, that thing that you're objecting to was in our opinion shows. And somebody said, like, well, can you, can, can you delineate? And it was this very careful delineation of, well, you know, from 6 to 9 a.m. there's opinion, and then there's news again until 4 p.m., and then, right. it, then, it, then it's opinion again. Uh, until uh, 7 p.m., at which point Brett Baer picks up and it becomes news for a little while, and then, you know, uh, it becomes uh, opinion again once uh, Hannity. Oh, right. you know, it, yeah. it was this but that's very a good idea for a show because yeah. they have the 10 o'clock news. What about the 10 o'clock opinions? Well, I, I mean, and, and to some extent, I, I think that what's happened in recent years is that that, that, that such a premium has been placed on uh, opinion uh, that uh, there's there's the new. Um, uh, show uh, the, the the newsroom where the newscaster sort of states his opinion and everyone is shocked. And I thought, like, no, like the, the <laughs> shocking thing would be for a newsman to sort of get out there and say, like, what I you know, like, what I think doesn't matter. Like, you know, that that that, that the truly radical Howard Beale moment today would just be like, I'm not telling you how I feel about this. You know, wow. you 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 may, you draw your own conclusions. Um, and, and I realize that objectivity is oppose and that, as you say, uh, the decision about what goes on the evening news is in itself an opinion, but uh, it almost feels like at this point there's still the pose of objectivity, but the actual thing itself has disappeared. And the big thing is that nobody really cares anymore, <laughs> really. Uh, Nancy, I, I have... Nobody uh, cares. It's just... It's, it's you know, like Tim just said, it's it's just it's all it's changed and evolved so much. I mean, back in the day when Walter Cronkite would say that's the way it is, we had thirty minute national newscasts. There were only three networks, three main networks. There was no twenty four hour news. There wasn't the need to sort of fill time with either the same stories over and over again or take the discarded stories that might have happened before and, and blow them out of proportion. It, it it's, it really is, it's weird. I mean, it's, it's a whole different way of being. Yeah. And, and I think that we're in a time now where you can just have a silo of news that all reflects your opinions back at you, and it has the form of something that seems objective. Uh, it still has the form of, of, a, of a Cronkite newscast at times. Uh, you know, you can tell yourself, like, well, I'm going to watch Fox or MSNBC, right. uh, their news show, and I'll watch their opinion show, and that way I will, ha I will be fully informed. But each of them is, is a silo that, you know, if you uh, are only watching things that you agree with and the news outlets that have the label of news but still uh, are, 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 are opinion-oriented, uh, you're not getting an accurate view of the world. I know, I have to admit, because I, I fall more into the MSNBC category. I'll try to watch Fox News, but even with MSNBC, I'm at this point now where if somebody says something that really pisses me off, I'll just like throw something at the screen and, and turn to Turner Classic Movies. Like, I've lost my, and then that's bad. I mean, I, I get so angry about certain things that I just, I can't take it in, and so I'll, you know, go to something else. It's a psychological problem, probably. Is there a psychiatrist in the house? <laughs> okay. Okay. And now for something completely different. The White House correspondent dinner tonight is going on. What would you suggest? What? What would you suggest? How come n none of you were there to start with? Uh, we thought it was more important to be with you, Morgan. <laughs> okay. Forget the big issue is uh, who is going to be the vice presidential candidate uh, with uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the seriously moderate from Massachusetts. What, what is his name again? Uh, but I think it's who's going to be in Romney's cabinet that I want to discuss. And uh, I can see uh, Ron Paul, the reason he continues in the race, he's obviously angling for a job, and I think he would be great as a Secretary of Defense. <laughs> or the Treasury. Or State. Now, do you have any suggestions? If not, we'll... 
wait for the White House dinner tonight. Yeah, I remember, I'm going to give a historical footnote about your first observation, who's going to be the vice president. I remember, I think it was in the campaign of 1972, it's usually not done that someone runs for vice president. But the former governor of Massachusetts, Endicott Chubb Peabody, uh, was, was running for vice president uh, in the Democratic, uh, not in the primaries, but in the Democratic at the convention. And he let it be known that he was running for vice president. And Dick Tuck, who is a famous uh, prankster, uh, got up and said, Endicott Peabody, I remember I was covering it for the Times, and he said, Endicott Chubb Peabody is the only guy, candidate ever to run uh, who had four names and four, four first names. And uh, so what's that? He said, Endicott Peabody Marblehead and Athole, that's where he came from. So this is his. Okay. On that note, we will take a, a few questions from the audience. Not that there could be any based on what we've said thus far, but, but do you have a microphone? And the way it can work is, well, you know how it works. Okay, question. Uh, my mentor, Neil Postman, once claimed that TV would lead us to amuse ourselves to death which I think is appropriate for comedy and politics. Do you think that the uh, Republican primaries are proof that we have actually done that? Who, is that a uh, rhetorical answer or? Well, have, or we, have we in fact, uh, who is are we dead? That's <laughs> Panelists? Tim, you're about to say, I'm not shirking it off to you, but you've said something, so. I, 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 I just can't imagine anyone considering those primaries that amusing. They were more stultifying and deadening than anything else, those, those, those debates. Um, and, and, uh, well, you are humor impaired. Yeah. I, well, no, I mean, no, they were, <laughs> right, there certainly was amusement, but man, it was more of a, a grind by the, by the end of that process. Uh, I don't know why they had so many debates. I don't know who decides. And, and the, each one was more frightening than the next, I thought, <laughs> just in terms of what, what level people took to say just the most outrageous things. And, you know, Herman Cain, I mean, I just have one, because he's black and I'm black, I just I gotta say, I, you know, I, I have a bunch of friends. Every time, sometimes you see like a black Republican or a con way conservative, I've heard people say, you know, they've lost their blackness and they're not, they're not one of us. And I would just say, they just lost their minds. That's what it was. <laughs> it's not a racial thing, but, Watching him in particular, oh, well, no, actually, oh, just about all of them said something ridiculous, but it was just an embarrassment. So many of them were just embarrassments, I thought. I didn't realize you were black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Question. Is this mic working? Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering um, if it's not too late to talk you into getting back into politics and maybe throwing your hat in this year, you know. Harold Stassen actually ran 13 times for president. I don't know how many times you've run. This, this, <laughs> this sounds like a mandate from the people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, my time has passed. <laughs> um, on a serious note. 40 um, years ago. The, um, when I, I think of some very funny uh, people, who, comedians who are, uh, that I can think of that mix that were political tend, tend to be more on the left or progressive. You know, I'm thinking about Lenny Bruce and Mort Saul uh, and more, re even Steve Allen was very progressive, you know. Um, uh, Richard Belzer, very progressive. George Carlin, very progressive. Um, are, are progressives funnier than conservatives? <laughs> Good question. Panel? No, I think Mort so. <laughs> and say, is there anyone I haven't offended yet? It was his <laughs> goodbye line, so. Um, I, I, I almost wonder if it's, I mean, I think that there are comedians uh, on the right who uh, are funny, 
Uh, can you name, I'm not saying this to be funny, but can you name any? Because I'll, I'll, I'll say, per, perhaps if you're on the left, you don't find them funny. Like it may be the it may be the thing. Like it's somebody. You know, certainly. I mean, Dennis Miller's out there. I feel like there 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 are a fair number of. Oh, P.J. O'Rourke is also. He's yeah, he can be funny. Yeah. yeah. I, I I feel like they're they're. they're Bush. Eh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unintentionally, yes. but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, th I think that the, I think that there there is a whole world of of, uh, of comedy on the right. Uh, I think it's more on radio than on television. Actually, I think okay. that I, uh, it was an odd thing of seeing, you know, left wing uh, attempting to do right wing radio, and it didn't quite pan out. For for whatever reason, Air America didn't take off in the way that That's I, right. that, that, that just like expected. on the on the reverse when the right wing kind of SNL version came out for like a I think there were like two or three the, episodes that half hour news, hour, that half hour, news yeah. hour it just tanked yeah they they also had a weird problem where uh, I don't know if you if you remember this like I think that they taped their shows well in advance which was like they, I, they, like, they kind of shot their, themselves in the foot for a topical political in comedy of, show. Yeah, being like, if you watch no, it, it was all like, wait, this is all stuff that happened three months ago. Why are you, uh, I, which, which is a way of saying, it's not to say that it couldn't work or wouldn't work, it's just to say that like. That's not funny. They, they, the way they did it, it really didn't work. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do think like, if you watch The Five, I'm sure there are people who find the uh, Republicans on that panel hilarious. And that's, you know, <laughs> that is that is the judge of what's funny if somebody finds it funny. So yeah. Yeah, okay. I think liberals are funnier. But anyway, that's just me. next question. So uh, every president uh, presidential era has kind of an iconic impersonator of that of that president, but we don't seem to have one with Obama, um, or at least I, I don't know if you if you think that there is one. But well, I thought Fred Armisen did a pretty good job. I really did. You know. You know, I did. Okay, then I mean. I don't mean to stop you, what So, you were do you saying. think that there's an iconic impersonator of Obama, and if not, why not? If so, why? Because I, I didn't realize that people thought he was iconic. I thought he was just kind of. Not. Well, you know, it might not be that he's iconic. It might be that he's the one who's you know gotten the most fame at doing him. But I, you know, part of it is I think that the times are different. But they don't have a lot of. In, I mean, I could be wrong. I'm looking to you, Tim, because you work on The Daily Show, and I consider you iconic in terms of your comic knowledge. But I don't, are there many impersonator comedians uh, these days? There's not like a David Fry or, or, uh, the, 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 the or Von, Von Meter, Meter or... Uh, I, he was, he was, yes, no, he was fabulous. And although I kind of feel like that may be, might have been a function of time. Like, I feel like... Uh, there were eight years, and by the end of it, like uh, it's one of those things where, where it starts off as kind of a, a very precise impression, and then at a certain point, as it goes along, uh, you know, given 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 you know a couple of years, it blossoms into this weird freakish thing that is its own thing, and I feel like perhaps you know if if Obama gets a second term, like there'll be an impersonator who can really just take it to the next level. Like, I, I can't remember when exactly Will Ferrell's Bush impression really began to, to take off, but it almost feels like you need a couple of years to grow it into something That's a great amazing. Point. Next question. Uh, Tim, before my question, I just have to say, I think Tina Fey hit Sarah Palin in about 30 seconds, so there could no, be that's, acceptance. That's, that's, yeah. that's um, but yeah. you've, you and The Daily Show have been a bit coy and ambivalent about the influence that you actually have on the world which I, I understand can be overwhelming when you started out basically in comedy and suddenly uh, with three or four epi episodes on The Daily Show, John is able to get legislation passed through Congress for the emergency workers who responded to 9-11. Right. And I wanted to maybe drill down to that specific example, if you could share with us how the writers, the crew, how everyone felt before, after, and during that, and whether uh, like how that decision was made or did it just stumble into and whether you would ever consider that, that there's some issues that are that important that you would kind of I, push. I, I, that, that, that was an exception. I, I think of that as an exception in the history of the show. Of, uh, and I think that was a case where it was so obvious and so wrong and John felt so passionately about it that uh, he wanted to make it clear how, how wrong it was. I, I, I think it came from the same impulse and the same process that drives us always, which is how do we feel about this, let's, let's express that. Uh, I, I think in that, that was a case where uh, we might have paid more attention to that 
to that issue and been more aggressive on it than 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 usual. But uh, so yeah, that, and and as with absolutely anything that happens on the show, that was that was driven by by John. Uh, you know, uh, yes, he's <laughs> it's his show. Um, so yeah. Okay. Next question. I asked this as a um, former producer for Mike Wallace, which is kind of scary considering what I'm about to ask you. But <laughs> comedy is a way of getting through some really tough things going on, like the uh, Zajoga bill. So are you ever going to consider handling the debates between the actual candidates for president? So in other words, Mitt Romney, Barack Obama. If Barack Obama is going to do a slow jam on Jimmy Fallon, I think that he would be open to a debate. The reason that I'm asking is because more truth comes out of comedy than certainly comes out of the news nowadays. So the wow. idea of having the same show and Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert have you know, the, the rally in DC, why not have a couple? of presidential debates. Oh, well, we, 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 would, wow. we, would, we would never lower ourselves to that level. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. What a cool idea, though. That's kind of a, I mean. It, it would be amazing. I don't think that Mitt Romney's handlers would allow him oh, within it. Oh, yeah. there's yeah. that. Right. I mean, it, but yeah, I, I, I can't imagine, uh, oh, and I can't know, imagine Obama's handlers. He did do the either. top 10 list on Letterman. I mean, there has been more, <laughs> uh, you know, more of an attempt I know he read it. He did read it, and someone else wrote. Okay, point taken. Right. Yeah. In terms question. of spontaneity and stuff, that's. I, I had an idea. Whoops. At point. Hold that question. I, no, no, no. I want to get. <laughs> okay, let's hear it, Victor. I had an idea at one point, which was uh, at the Nation when I was at the Nation, and that was that we would try to rent uh, commercial time on one, not on one of the debates, but on one of the Sunday morning talk shows, Meet the Press or whatever it was, and. And our commercial would be a live commercial. We would put on one of our columnists, whether it's Katha Pollitt, Eric Alterman, or Bud Trillin, and what would happen was they would say, they'd come on right after an exchange of questions, and they'd say, well, Tim Russett, you asked this, but what about the follow-up question? Why didn't you ask that? And they wouldn't rent us the time to have those live <laughs> debates, so that was it. We missed a big Darn it. Question. Hi, um, I'm a sketch writer at the People's Improv Theater and Upright Citizens Brigade and uh, performer and stuff. And I feel like I'm always searching for like the most unbiased, uh, un like uh, unfiltered news source. And we've certainly covered this topic tonight. Do you, what is your personal opinion of like what is the most uncommentary news source? Mean, uh, that's a that's a really hard question because well, it's. Do you mean like an entire network or particular yeah. shows? Oh, I know that's really hard. Yeah. It's, it's, I'll I mean, tell you what. I'll tell you my okay. opinion. Okay. Um, there are there are two particular shows, both coincidentally uh, led by Nation writers, um, a Melissa Harris Perry show on MSNBC, <laughs> and um, Up with Chris Hayes. That I that not only uh, not only do I think that they're a bit more unbiased because of the mix of people that they have on the shows, and they really do make an effort to balance things. Mm -hmm. You know, I have all, all kinds of issues about false equivalencies and how everything maybe doesn't have a pro and con side, but that's not you know not in, anyway. Notwithstanding that, um, and the other thing that I think they do. It's not the traditional way that news was presented, but what I really like about both shows is, like here, people are around a table having a conversation. It's not those Brady Bunch boxes where everyone's separated, yeah. and oftentimes when I've been on those shows, I'm Ann B. Davis right in the middle, yeah. having a shriek to just penetrate, to be heard. That, that conversation part, I think, again, it's not the way news has been presented in the, in the past, but. There's something about it I find to be really honest. Um, I don't know. I don't know what you guys the, think. Um, I want to weigh in on this. The biggest problem is the way news has changed. Instead of, you know, we have hours and hours in the evening when people are watching the news where you do not have news anymore. You have uh, people talking about the one or two or three major stories. 
And uh, in order to do news, you have to have two or three people, so-called experts, talking about the news. And what l is left out is uh, the protein, the news itself. There is so much news that's never being covered. Uh, and they may have covered in the daytime, but you're not around 24-7. Yeah. And that's what I feel is the major problem that, that's probably... Uh, you know, Fox News really start, kick-started this movement, and then CNN abandoned its so-called hard news coverage to catch up to them because of the ratings. Now, what I do, I, I say a pox on all of their houses, and what I do is, is watch the, uh, uh, the BBC yeah. World News, which on my... Yeah. My Fios, it's, it's listed there right after the regular news. And I am amazed, where do they get all these things to talk about? Where do they find this news? That's and the they way. go all yeah. over the world. They have correspondence in the Af African countries. And wherever something is happening, there's somebody there. And they give them, they don't give them the 30-second sound bite, but these people are walking around for two minutes. It's like a mini-series already <laughs> on the BBC. That's what I do. And I'm not interested in opinions about the news. And, and who are these experts anyway? I always feel that the people that, that are, are, are frozen in the basement of the networks <laughs> and they thaw them out, <laughs> professors or commentators, uh, no offense or anything, <laughs> and they, they're, they're ready, they just throw them on. Now, I don't, you know, I don't know who these people are. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I butted. I, 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 I have a different take on this, which is that what you're really asking when you say are there unbiased folks out there, not just on broadcasting, but in print, um, you're asking a question, what is their ideology? And to me, the assumption is you got the nation on the left and you have National Review or the Weekly Standard on the right, and you have the New York Times and, and the NBC and CBS and these other folks and that think of Journal. themselves in the Wall Street, that think <laughs> of themselves as being in the center, but, and they say, we don't have any ideology. We're objective, we just tell it the way it is. <laughs> My view is they have the ideology of the center, and it is part of the ideology of the center to deny that one has any ideology. <laughs> but that is really what your assumptions are when you go out there and ask the question of what is news, what do we cover, and what is real, the ideology of the center, it seems to me it's a great PhD subject for someone to define exactly what it is, belief in God, there ought to be two parties, and things like that. And that's the, the basis of the assumption on which all everything is covered. So it's important, I think, as a writer, you can identify what that is. It's an article idea for social research. Question. Nancy, you mentioned earlier um, a lot of attacks on women. I think a lot of the misogyny that we've seen is disguised as humor. Um, and, you know, humor is most useful when it's challenging a uh, power dynamic or pointing out a social dynamic, but lately I feel like it's been used to reinforce, um, you know, regressive political dynamics with respect to women. And I was wondering if you had suggestions for the whole panel of how to push back against that without being accused of being humorless feminists, because to be honest, the feminists I know are disproportionately funny with respect to the rest of the population. So I'm really tired of hearing that as, as like, oh, you just don't get it. It's a, it's a rape joke on Facebook with 8 million thousand likes. You know, that kind of stuff is like, no, it's not, it's not, not funny. I know, you know, it's, look, it's, it's one of these things where I, occasionally I think all women have to feel the same way about fill in the blank, and then you find out that we, we all don't. Um, one of my favorite jokes is, you know, how many feminists does it take to screw in a light bulb? That's not funny, because it's BS. <laughs> because I think, I mean, I think to be a feminist or to be a woman in this world, you better ha be funny. You better have, like, a sense of humor. That's the only way to really operate. Um, and I agree with you. There is, it, yeah, I know. It, you make a very good point, and I don't know how I would advise. I keep going back to what Tim said about The Daily Show and about Jon Stewart which is just such a smart thing about starting from how you really feel. Because if, you know, now some people have really evil feelings, you know. Some people have misogynistic, nasty feelings. And I think out of that, 
the stuff, it's just not going to be funny, but I think there is a way to be intelligent and, uh, you know, well, meanness can be funny. I don't know, you know, we'll have to talk afterwards. Let's, let's, we'll have a little, we'll have a little powwow afterwards, but I, I know that I know other women who are strong and feminist and have a great sense of humor. Um, I like to think that the stuff that I say, I think about it and I, I, love women, I love being a woman, I, I, I take pride in it, and if it means that I'm not having a sense of humor by not thinking that something that Rush says about uh, Sandra Fluke or something like that means that I'm, you know, I'm uptight, well, blank, blank, you know, because that's not true. Your, your blank just isn't funny, you know? I don't know that I answered your question at all, but I would love to talk more with you about it afterwards. How, how many does it take? <laughs> that's not funny. No, yeah, that's the joke. See, that's the question. Okay, I'd I'd like to pick up on a comment that she just made, which is that some of these misogynist jokes are disguised as humor. The most important thing to me in life is humor, and I don't think you can disguise humor. <laughs> It's either funny or it's not funny. And Rush Limbaugh's comments, I don't think anybody, rightist, leftist, or what, would say that they were funny. I don't think they were even meant as a joke. So that's an example of, you, can't, the, the, you know, funny is funny. And I think that there's a natural uh, conflict between politics and comedy, even though comedy humanizes in all of the politicians that go on Letterman and other comedy shows are making a wise choice because it humanizes them. Uh, and many times isn't a challenge because it's written for them. But, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and, and they come out more likable. Right. And that's because uh, humor humanizes. And the essence of humor is that nothing is sacred. The essence of a really good joke is that nothing is sacred. And I would suggest that for all of us, we have our sacred weaknesses or weak sacrednesses, if you will. In your case, it might be your race or your gender. Uh, in other cases, it might be leftist politics or anything that we, we see as sacred. I've met leftists that have no sense of humor. They're too rabid. They consider it their cause too sacred. And that's really the evil that comedy is attacking at all times. And I would, you know, uh, in terms of what is a sacred cow, I mean, the fact that the, uh, the, the Muhammad hat with the bomb raised more protest than the Abu Ghraib uh, photos, if I'm pronouncing it that well, but uh, is because Muhammad is more sacred than human life. Ooh. All right? You, you attack your God. I mean, for Jews, it would be Holocaust jokes. Uh, uh, jokes about Trayvon might be hitting your sacred uh, area. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, the Pope jokes, whatever. Uh, if somebody... <laughs> I mean, I don't want to... <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing you at you just word because you word. said you were raised Catholic. I don't know that you hold Catholicism as sacred, but anybody that does finds Pope jokes not funny. How about new school jokes? <laughs> new school jokes. Here, so here's, I, I, here's, I just... Here's the thing. Here's yeah. the thing. We're sitting in the new school, which was partly founded by people who came over from Germany during th those years. Exactly. And, and funny is funny on the one hand. On the other hand, when I look at cartoon magazines, I've been looking at Der Sturmer from 1935. Der Sturmer was very funny to a lot of the people living in Germany, not to the Jewish community, who were the victims of Der Sturmer's jokes. Right. So there comes a point where what's funny is not funny. And, and so you have to... And it doesn't mean that you're wrong about what's sacred and what isn't sacred, but it does mean that there's, there are lines here, and it's very, they're very difficult to define what they are. And when you're dealing with minorities and you're dealing with victims in a socially structured situation, that's when you have a problem with what's funny is funny to me. So, Thank you. And that's not funny. <laughs> Thank you. It does depend on the point of the receiver. It does. Okay. So it, but the point of view of the receiver in those cases was you don't want to be sent to a concentration camp. 
So. Okay. Uh, we now have the honor of uh, hearing from a, a noted political cartoonist, Mort Gerberg. You're not going to hear from me except a question. Victor, I'm delighted that you're doing this book. And, we can't uh, hear you. I said I'm delighted that you're doing this book on cartooning, obviously, uh, Victor. And you, you were going into a, an interesting uh, uh, direction that actually I was talking with Bob about, Grossman, a little bit before, uh, which had to do, again, with the reaction to cartoons. And uh, despite the millions of words at this point that have been written in satire and some of them really outrageous things, I can't remember some reactions that have been uh, found in terms of cartoons. I mean, all the Trudeau stuff that is in, printed in publications that have been uh, resulted in newspapers dropping them, uh, letters that are being written. And again, uh, to use this Danish example, which you've used before, what is it about the cartoon, which now you are examining, which is so much more powerful that it's going to experience or, or evoke such a reaction that's much more. Even the stuff that, that Krasner wrote about in The Realist, some of the most outrageous of all, did not, even by his own admissions, uh, produce the same kind of reactions as some of those outrageous cartoons. Uh, so I was wondering, in your book, are you discussing that? Are you going out further? What is it about the images? That, Read the book. No, seriously. I will. Seriously, finish it, finish seriously. It. I asked your question to the great art director, Milton Glaser. He said it has to do with the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Oh, uh, yeah. Martin and, Martin. and um, the, you know, one hemisphere deals with rational things and the other is emotions. And there is a new, whole new field of neuroscience on the brain, which I've looked at, I have to say, called neuroaesthetics, which deals with the question you're asking. And here's one of the experiments they do to, sh and to show sort of why caricatures work. And, and the experiments show that when you look at a caricature, uh, people recognize caricatures before they recognize photographs. And uh, that has to do partly with humor, but it has to do partly with the grotesque. And so ex example of an experiment, <laughs> Forgive me, herring gull chicks. Herring gull chicks get fed by pecking on their mother's beak, which is long and has a red dot at the end. The psycho psychologist experimenters, who might teach at new school for all I know, have introduced herring gull chicks to a long stick with two or three red dots on the end. The longer the stick, the more they peck, and the, and the more red dots on the end, the more feverishly they peck. So this shows that uh, if you exaggerate a feature, it has an emotional response on herring gull chicks. Whether the same thing is true, whether the same thing is true about people who look at them, who knows? There are experiments with rats who get rewarded when they see rectangles and punished when they go to squares. This shows the same thing about rats. Is, this, is it true about people? There's the question that I invite you to ponder. Victor, so. in, 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 during the Vietnam War, never mind about herring and cream sauce or, or without, during the Vietnam War, the New Yorker must have published thousands and thousands and thousands of words uh, in protest against the, the Vietnam War. Uh, many of them were satirical. They published three cartoons. I'm not talking about herring, I'm talking about ideas. And these ideas were done either in prose or in, in, in visual things. And you don't have to answer the question, I'll read the book. But I mean, it's, it's, I am. I'm happy, I'm happy to answer, but, but in this way. The New Yorker magazine received thousands of protests when it ran a cover by Barry Blitt showing the Obamas oh, yeah. in terrorist oh, yeah. garb. Okay. If someone. A satirist had made the point that that cartoonist was making that this is the way the right wing regards the Obamas, no protests. So it's true that pictures trigger, images trigger these things, and you have a whole new field that claims to know the answer to why okay. when they talk about neuroaesthetics. Thank you. I don't agree with them, but Next question. There we no, are. I'm sorry, Thank I just you. have to say, yeah. my main issue with that was I kept waiting for the complimentary cover with uh, John McCain and his wife, maybe 
you know, she's popping pills or something, some sort of exaggeration to sort of balance that out. And it never... Like what the left-wing caricature of McCain would have been? Yes, or? and yeah. it never happened. That's where I got a little peeved. Next question. Hi, um, I have a question, and I have a new school joke, and some of you might get it. Um, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the bathrooms uh, somewhere, um, I didn't draw them President Van Zandt. Um, there's graffiti, and it says, um, it says, I wish there were more straight guys at the new school. And underneath that, it says, I wish there were less heteronormative skanks at the new school. And then under that, it says, I wish that there were more... Um, more gender queer glitter puking glam rock stars at the new school. Um, you would get it if you went to the new school. Um, so, There's a satirist in the new school. <laughs> so um, my question is um, actually about about um, the limit of intelligent comedy to subvert or to critique a complex or a system that needs critique that is either in stasis or corrupt or just because, because that's what comedy is there for, it should be there. Um, when you become so entrenched and almost obsessed about a particular world, perhaps like the US political system, um, when covering uh, the presidential campaign, do you, bolster up that system rather than actually critiquing and uh, critiquing it and subverting it. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question that, that we, that, that, that comedians become entrenched in the system as opposed to fighting it, is that the? Well, because, the, because you're so acutely aware and, and informed about what's going on, which is of course necessary and wonderful, but when you bring so much attention to a system that's that's not working well. What's like? Is there a line where you're where you're where actually supporting the you're system? actually supporting the system rather than than critiquing it or or subverting it? Jeez, I don't know. I, I this is a great question. I don't. I really don't know. Tim. Uh, yeah. I. I. I, I... <laughs> I'll be honest. Like I. I. I don't think of. Uh, comedy in those terms, in part because I think it, our brains would explode if we had to <laughs> really grapple with the consequences of, and, and like that's, that's, that's so many more elements to deal with than any one could handle. It, it almost feels asking, like, you, guys. Um, you know, it's sort of like asking somebody who's riding a unicycle to explain exactly what they're doing at that moment, uh, or the, it just like, they'll fall over and they'll look more ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, I don't. Um, or trying to describe what's funny or what makes something funny when it's so yeah, yeah. layered or something. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I don't mean to suggest, uh, I, 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 as you said, like uh, I don't know the answer to it. I feel like smarter people than I can answer it. Uh, I saw that this issue of social research has two essays uh, uh, that deal with uh, my boss in them, and I bet that those people could answer it better than I can, uh, because, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't. I will say this, I can, I can say this. I, uh, I am American, and I grew up in New York and Queens and, and lived in different places, and I, have a, I really do have a fundamental belief in this country and how I think it could work. And I, I mean, you know, I've been told by people that I'm insane because of that, but I just, I've had some sort of strange optimism. Um, and maybe part of the stuff that I do or why I do it is because I, I'm trying to like make that happen in some weird way. If it's, if it's not by making some absurd point funny, then maybe making a change or, trying to show a lot of ways that we're actually alike as opposed to uh, the things that keep dividing different kinds of people. I think that is part of why, why I do the stuff that I do. I, I don't know if that helps, but I was just thinking about that. And I guess in some way I do believe in some aspects of the system, and I would like to see them run the way I want them to run. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, okay, that's it. Uh, let me tell you are, are you, are you suggesting you that something is unsatisfactory about our current system? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what will we be laughing about if not those 19 debates 
after 275 years, those are the best people that we could have <laughs> running for president. Are you uh, suggesting uh, that the current system is there to amuse us? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I said, are you... <laughs> <laughs> are you suggesting that the current system is simply there to amuse us? Now, here's the thing. The, uh... Uh, I didn't hear you. <laughs> All right, Victor. Well, here's the thing, you know. See me it's after class. It's a it's a you can all meet together after. We'll all meet together in the reception. It's a complicated thing because, yes, uh, comedians have a stake in the system. The more absurd it is, the more they have a stake in it. So at The Nation, we used to have a line, if it's bad for the country, it's good for the nation. <laughs> the circulation doubled after George Bush invaded Iraq. So there are those paradoxes in it, and uh, the, the great, and then the question is cartoonists. Who do they like to be in office? Which I've been looking at, and Doug Marlett once said, you know, everyone loves Nixon be, as a cartoonist because his nose told you we were going to invade Cambodia. <laughs> so, okay, let's um, finish off the question. Um. First, I want to say I love your point about uh, opinion and fact in news media. I think that's the point of points, and I just want to say that. I love that you discuss that in, it's in some uh, depth. And I have a few questions, and you, you actually just answered one of my questions. I'll just sort of say all the questions, if you don't mind. Um, one of them is, do all of you sort of come to your job with some sort of objective yourself, like what you want to accomplish? I'm, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a million, there's a few things, but I, I wonder about that. And also, I've done some comedy writing, and I think about people in your position, and I think, oh, how could I ever do that? How could I feel like I was well-informed enough to be doing one of the jobs that you are doing. And, um, those, okay, we'll start with those two. I, uh, so, and so could you say something about, I know that you said a great thing about, you know, BBC, uh, looking at the BBC, but I think, I'll just say, I think the other consideration is what we as Americans deal with is given to us as media and is opinion and truth and what the focus is and what's going on and so how do you deal with all that when you're trying to do this objective that you're trying to do? Okay, panelists, this is actually the material for the second episode, but... Um, I just said I, I wanted my job at Monocle so I could get Marvin elected president, so... <laughs> Marvin. Uh, I, I think uh, to, to answer your, your questions, I guess, in, in turn, um, uh, the second one first, uh, how do we, uh, your, your question, if I understand it, was like, how, how do we get well informed enough at, at, at what we do yes. to sort of be able to do the show each day? Mm -hmm. And the lucky thing there is we have a department that, that scours all of the uh, television, uh, you know, all the cable networks. Mm -hmm. We have a researcher who can bring us whatever we're going to do, he will bring us a pile of information. Uh, uh, we, you know, we all try and read as much as we can and sort of sample as widely as we can. Mm -hmm. I watch Fox and Friends every morning, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a great way to get any information, <laughs> but it's a great way to get what the talking points for the day will be. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, it's, I, I cannot recommend it enough. It's, it's, it's a fascinating, any given morning, you will see like five amazing things uh, on Fox and Friends. Um, but yeah, it's uh, if if I didn't work at the show and didn't have uh, yeah. access to that, I'm not sure what I would do. I, I guess I would try and read as widely as as I as I mm -hmm. could to sort of get as much information as I could. Uh -huh. um, as far as the objective to the the other yeah. question, I mean. I think our objective really is to is almost more uh, therapeutic for ourselves than for anything else. It's just a chance to yell back at the television and ha have someone else hear it. Um, so yeah, anytime something we do actually does have consequence, we're sort of startled and amazed uh, and a little weirded out. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nancy? Well, I, I echo a lot of that, except I don't have a research department or anything like that, which makes me cry sometimes. <laughs> yeah. um, I've. 
I'm trying to time manage better than I have in the past, mm -hmm. and I never thought that Twitter would actually come in handy, oh. but not for the comments, but because, again, you, if you start the day kind of combing through that, you'll get a lot of different kinds of talking points and a lot of things that people are talking about. So taking some time doing that has helped. Yeah. I don't watch Fox and Friends. I'm going to have to start. <laughs> what I, but no, you're, because it, you should see, quote, what all sides think. I end up, I'll end up maybe watching a little bit of Morning Joe, and then I'll start screaming at the set and I'll have to turn that off. Um, I read the Times, but the Times, the New York Times gets me mad. A lot of things get me mad. I have to just sort of switch around. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of uh, like black news websites that I read. The Grio is one. Mm -hmm. um, Color Lines is another. Uh, I think there's another one called Black News. And there's just a bunch of different things. Then there's the occasional day where I just I can't deal with it, and I just watch repeats of The New Adventures of Old Christine. So, <laughs> because really what started this whole thing for me was I was at Second City with Julie Louis-Dreyfus years and years ago and liked her, and she was really nice and you know gave me a ride once, and we talked about stuff. And then she went on to be like huge, and I didn't have that kind of acting career, and that's why I ended up doing this. But like I said before, and I love this. I actually love this more than doing parts, yeah. but it it is to purge, uh -huh. to get these feelings out, to yell back, and also because I, either whether it's funny or if it's something that's a little more serious, because I really, I kind of believe in some of the structure and I want to make things better. I'm actually yeah. even thinking of running for mayor of my little town, <laughs> like in 10 years. No, you, the, re the main reason why is, and it has more to do with my left of center friends than anybody on the right side. I, Got, I've gotten so angry at my way progressive friends bitching and moaning <laughs> and picking apart and Obama caved and he did this and why do we even make health care? It should have been voted down. <laughs> and no one, these are people that won't even go to a committee meeting mm -hmm. about anything. Mm -hmm. So that's just another way I want to like rail against the machine we're, or something. I don't know. We're running out of time. Oops. So I will just answer the second part of yeah. your question. <laughs> my goal as a writer. I want to change the world. Yeah, let's get going. Question. Good evening. Um, Good evening. My question is a quick one. Uh, it's for Mr. Carvel. Um, I was just wondering if there was any place, like on the show, any time on the show where it's like the staff, they kind of forget about all the the comedy and all the um, like the funniness behind the stories. I mean the the news you guys tell, I guess, and like talk about it in like a very serious way. Um, I, I think that we we don't talk about what we do in a broader sense in a very serious way. I think that oftentimes the way that we uh, will will develop each day's show is to talk about. Uh, the story in a fairly serious way and arrive at you know what we think about it and then try and make that funny. Um, but as far as like talking in a broader sense about uh, what we do, that, that happens very seldom. There was a couple of years ago, there was, there was Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. I don't know if any of you watched that, where uh, the comedy writers all talked a lot about how important what they did was and the role that it had in society. And we all watched that like, oh my god, who talks like, who would ever talk that way about what, what they do? Um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I think one thing that John has said in the past, and I think it is true, is sometimes he looks at the media and feels like uh, they are very silly people doing a very serious job, and that we are uh, somewhat serious people doing a fundamentally silly job. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think I don't, I'm not sure if that's if I've answered your question yet, or, or okay, yeah. enough. Okay. We'll, I'm we'll, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we'll take that for an answer. Next question. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You finished? Yeah. Question about the Colbert Super PAC. What happens when comedy is inserted into the political process? Uh, what happens when comedy gets uh, in? What, what do you think happens when comedy itself is inserted into the real life political process? It seems, it seems like there's like the comedy life and then there's the real life. What happens when those two intersect? Do you think they're selling out? <laughs> Opting uh, into the system? <laughs> I, I think it's a point of commentary on how broken the process is. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't speak specifically to the super PAC because it, it actually is separate and, and, and being handled by, by the Colbert folks. Um, 
I mean, I think comedy is already present in the political process. Right. Like, it's just, it's almost a rounding error to add uh, this much more. Um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's, I think what Stephen's doing is brilliant. Um, and I'm kind of as fascinated as anybody to see how it plays out. I, I don't know where he's going with it. Um, I'll, I'll be interested. I tell you one thing is I think that when he did that in a way by making it funny and also sort of simplifying how, uh, how simplifying the explanation of how the super PACs work, I think a lot of people were much more aware of, of that entity than they, were, than, than they were before. So I think in that sense, it's really valuable that he did that. Good. These are the last two questions. We've mainly been talking about uh, media and politics and comedy, but what about political figures themselves using humor? How important is it for uh, a politician to display a sense of humor? How do you think that they can use it strategically? And are, are we in a real decline with that at this point? Or? You know, one of, the, one of the really two bad things in American politics is that Al Franken, when he got elected, stopped being funny. Right. And, uh, he should have used, and it's not too late, he should use his skill as a satirist to talk about what's going on. Instead of, he, his big worry was people wouldn't take him seriously, and so he begins to sound like everybody else. And he's smarter than that. So, now Adlai, now on the other hand, Adlai Stevenson, I used to think he was gonna be president. And <laughs> so, he was too funny. So. He, he uh, Senator Franken should have said, uh, you know, I've been accused of making a mockery out of uh, politics, but uh, politics is already a mockery. He could have said something like that. Uh, the last question here. Hi, I'm working on a, a, a launch of a political satire site called the Apocalypse Review. And the first thing we're trying to do, of course, is to be funny. Right? But the second thing we're trying to do is to not get our asses sued. And my question for you is to what extent is litigation used against, has it been used against any of you to sort of muzzle you? Do you find that you're respected and your right to tell jokes is open or every day is there a hundred letters in your inbox? Uh, <laughs> Excuse me, from uh, lawyers uh, trying I'm, to see I'm, you? Honestly, uh, Un unless, and, and there's a, there is a possibility, there is something they're not telling us. Uh, <laughs> like, the letters go elsewhere. Uh, you know, so if there are any, uh, I, I, I can't recall a, an instance of us being sued. Well, I, I, I've never been sued, well, but in terms of trends. letters, again, see, th that's why it would be so cool to work at The Daily Show. You've got researchers, <laughs> you've got a whole level of buffering when it comes to letters. And I, cereal in the morning. Uh, wow, really? Yeah, no, it's nuts. Damn. <laughs> we, gotta, we have to, we'll talk after. Um, I, uh, because I have a website and because I have a Twitter account and stuff, I'll, I'll get letters. I'm, sometimes they're really, really nice ones, I assume, like from people who agree with me or, and I'm not always trying to be agreed with. And, and some of the letters I like the most are people who say, well, you know, I don't agree, but you made me think, blah, blah, blah. Now, these aren't legal letters, but I've gotten a lot of really, really scary, mean, vicious letters. And the young lady who asked me earlier about uh, comedy and women and feminism, I hope she's still here. That's an interesting thing because unlike men that I know who do kind of opinion stuff, in these letters, it's always ripping my appearance, talking about my hair. I like my hair, right? <laughs> but saying me, oh, thank you. Um, what about weird, feminine, up? weird, nasty, sexual, demeaning, misogynistic things that have nothing to do with what I said, but they go right there. So there is that. Um, I wish I could sue them, but you know. <laughs> but um, I don't know. You know, I don't know if no. any of you guys have faced anything like that. As, as the editor of the Nation, I would get hate mail. Uh, my favorite one said, you're a piece of snot in a barrel of slime. My <laughs> wife has that to frame that. But, <laughs> but the fact is that cartoonists, especially caricatures, get more mail than many writers. And my theory as to why is that there's no answer to a cartoon. There's no such thing as a cartoon to the editor, unless you happen <laughs> to be a cartoonist <laughs> yourself. <Yeah. So. laughs> That's good, thank you. That's, that's possible. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have another panel show to moderate, <laughs> but we're going to have to stop this. 
Uh, we hope you found this an enlightening afternoon, and we hope that it gave you food for thought, if not indigestion. <laughs> if not, then I strongly recommend you read the magazine. Some of the articles need a laugh track, but they're very interesting anyway. Pick it up at your local bodega, or better to subscribe. Thank you, panelists, you did a great job.